Alô, alô? Alô, alô? Testando? Deu certo? Bom. Está então, começa com isso. Alô, alô. Ah, isso também tá ligado. Alô, alô. Tá, agora tá. Bom, bom dia a todas. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all your to work. To the, the subject of art as a memory. Uh, and that's uh, an unfolding of the exhibition, Yadus, a memory of dictatorship in Latin America. And, what, and that's going to happen in Jan until January at the Memory of Resistance in Sao Paulo. This event counts with the support of the group of research for human rights here at University of Sao Paulo, and it is supported by Memorial da Resistência and Pinacoteca. Also, Get Institute and the Dean Office here at the university. There are some questions in the proposal. When we, we propose this meeting, there are some very interesting questions. And to discuss art and memory, we don't have to, we can't forget Goya, the founder of it. We'll have the participation of Horst Hoheisel from Germany, Andreas Kinitz, and also Rodrigo Yanis. And it's very interesting. I was looking at the production, the, their works, and what caught my attention was the work they did with the Yanomami people in Brazil. That's what I was asking. So you speak Portuguese and said, no, that you have an experience there. And this work around the idea of negative monuments, of counter monuments, I also remember a few years ago to see uh, one of Horst's work called Signs of Life, and it was very interesting, beautiful, at Museu Lazar Segal many years ago. And all people involved in this issue, art and memory, and the possibility of transforming it somehow transforming memory through art. And we have here Marcio Seligman, who is a reference, our highest reference in this sense of working on with violence, testimony. I have Walter Benjamin here. So it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And I'd like to let you know that this event is recorded and it's part of the memory work, this kind of meeting that we, we've we been having, that from here we are going to write a document. It's a memory document of what, ha what, will be, what we will live here, what we will say here. Very important stuff for today. And will be transmitted through IEA channel live for those who want to take part of it. We agreed that we are going to have like 15 minutes for each one of the speakers and that we would start with Andreas, then Horst, and then Rodrigo, and then Mars, Marcio. They will be trying to 
bring this issue uh, that we've been we've been talking about in the following way: How artists can serve as agents in in put in that research, and how can they become agents of uh, historical combat? That's some of the, the questions that we are going to talk about. Thank you. Now, Andreas, have the stage. Obrigada pela introdução. Então, a gente vai falar. Monuments, moving monuments. And um, so, because we don't have so much time, we start immediately, and I pass to Horst. Yes. Uh, thank you for the invitation, but I wanted, before I talk something about our work, I want to speak uh, about my experience in the seven, end of the 17th, living uh, with the Yanomami. The, uh, I, the uh, Yanomami, this experience was very important for me because I worked before as a forestry scientist in a ecosystem analysis about the tropical rainforest and we studied uh, this uh, ecosystem and I did my PhD uh, uh, about this uh, forest but uh, we uh, to analyze uh, the f uh, forest and the system we had uh, to destroy and uh, to cut the trees and to destroy the orchid uh, orchids and uh, at the end uh, to know how many kilogram nitrogeno uh, uh, circle in a uh, hectare of uh, rain, rainforest. But after this, I went uh, to the Yanomami uh, without a, a scientific question. And uh, the Yanomami told me a completely different side of the uh, forest of uh, all, the, because uh, they live with it as in a totality. It's part of the, their life and they produce art always without knowing that it is art. So the, their life and their tools and uh, uh, it's still all together and that gave me, was a reason, uh, one of the reasons and they gave me the courage to change from a well-paid scientific uh, job at the university, as many people have here, to switch uh, to the uh, a life of a free artist. And uh, the Yanomami showed me uh, the way. And if I am now, uh, 30 years later, or 40 years later, sometimes depressed, then I think about this uh, uh, day with the Yanomamis and I feel better. Good. <laughs> that it's a, a very uh, uh, important experience I got uh, here. So we start uh, with the Ashrod Fountain in Kassel, where I live. It's uh, in front of the city hall, and there a Jewish donator gave to the city in 1908 this fountain. The Nazis destroyed it, and I reconstructed it in 1987 as a negative monument. The next one? Can you? Yes, uh, it, it uh, reappeared. Uh, some months on the place, but then, uh, then we turned it upside down, and now the obelisk uh, and the sculpture of the fountain goes down until the groundwater, 12 meters. Next, the only uh, was you see is a hole, is a negative form, and the water now runs very noisy down into this. Uh, a negative, and the people became very angry because so many tax money 
uh, state money and you see nothing, only a, <laughs> a, a hole. Uh, but the neo-Nazis came there for a manifestation also, uh, and it uh, was a consequence I, that I was treated by the neo-Nazis and my family more than one year, and it was a very difficult uh, a year of family life because uh, we as artists do monuments about the Holocaust, uh, but uh, but people, uh, but we have the neo Nazis and they are growing this uh, right uh, uh, movements in uh, Germany now. And uh, people ask me because you can uh, take this negative form again out, it's only. 12 by 12 centimeters uh, on a pedestal or, or a, on a pillow. Uh, so you can take it out by a crane and turn it around again. And people ask me, when uh, could it be that you take it again out and uh, put it in a positive uh, form there? And then I answer always, uh, uh, when the last neo-Nazi disappeared from Germany, then I am ready <laughs> to take it out again. But that uh, will spend time. So only what you see, and this was a silent concert of the Academy of Music on the Memorial Day when the Nazis destroyed this fountain. There was, uh, it was a, a concert of silence. This is a historic photo of the Buchenwald concentration camp. This is very close to Weimar, the very well-known city of the so-called good ghost of Germany, Goethe, Schiller, Herder, Nietzsche, Wieland, and so on. And this shows the Appell place at, uh, at the Ettersburg, five kilometers out of Weimar. And after the liberation of the camp, uh, the American troops helped the prisoners uh, to uh, get liberated in April 45. And you can see on that photo below um, a small kind of square where the um, uh, survivors of the camp erected an, another obelisk form because this is at that time the most uh, common form to commemoration. So it's um, this uh, ob wooden obelisk was erected by the survivors and behind the trees of the camp and another historic photo of that period shows the entrance building where in the, in the entrance uh, the signs uh, or the it's written jedem uh, das seine very famous uh, and um, terrible uh, sentence and uh, but after some weeks this wooden uh, obelisk um, was uh, transformed into a, a wooden speech podest for the Soviet, um, because it was a, a Soviet uh, zone um, of this German part, and it was the first of May. Uh, political uh, speech, and after this first May thing, it was um, away. It was destroyed and was gone and forgotten. And Horst and I was invited by the director of Buchenwald, Volker Knick, in '95 uh, to the 50th uh, anniversary of um, of the liberation of that camp. Uh, to to find that place again and uh, do a kind of um, marking or something, we were super free to um, design anything. And so we could find the place uh, with the help of the uh, historic photos. And we marked that with a simple steel blade in the ground of the so-called Appel place. But... Um, <coughs> This simply simpleness has uh, something uh, carry something because it's warmed up all day, all night, uh, all days through the year, 365 days 
to body, human body temperature, 37 degrees. So if you go down to the ground, touch that steel plate at that uh, cold place, in a double meaning cold, coldness uh, place, you can feel um, what, what humanity means. This is what all of us has in the, the blood temperature, not depending on our color of the skin or our languages or religions or sexualities, and even not whether you're a perpetrator or a victim. So it shows, it maybe this is a wonderful, um, example for memory memorial that explains um, that all of us are human yeah. and uh, so you can see the snow is melting and children if they come with uh, their schools school classes they of, of course they love to touch this memory um, and feel the warmth, and you can feel it, touch it, but you, in the same moment, it goes to your heart and your brain in the same time, and it's a, it's a quite easy message. Uh, and uh, a former president also visited this place, but this the reason was uh, his uncle was uh, in the tr uh, U.S. forces troop. His uncle was one of that. Uh, troop, uh, troopers of the liberation of that camp. And so this is a wonderful photo. It's an anniversary some years ago in April. This is an April photo. It's super cold there. It's a terrible place. And in between you have this warmth. And I can show you now it's a wonderful, uh, super simple video, some minutes only from uh, famous Harun Faroqi and um, it's I played now three minutes So this is a clip out of a, a film from Harun Faroqi called Transmission. And um, it shows how, um, how if, you, if you touch, get touched, touch or get touched by a memorial that, that's a f metaphor and a, a trans form of transfer or transmission.
Now we go on with another project. Oh. Yes, this is a project about uh, the forgotten victims of the Holocaust because the Holocaust started in 40, 41, in uh, uh, 39. Uh, with a mass murder uh, on the uh, psychiatric patients from the psychiatric clinics in Germany. The Nazi took them in buses, in grey buses, transported them to gas cameras and uh, murdered more than 200,000 patients. And it was uh, the experience and uh, the experiment uh, to develop uh, the la later uh, Holocaust uh, uh, gas chambers in Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor, and the other places. And, uh, uh, but uh, this group of victims uh, didn't have a lobby, and so they got now as the last one uh, a monument in Berlin, a memorial place in Berlin. They were completely forgotten because these were German victims, not uh, Jewish victims, and from uh, many German f families. And uh, so uh, often these families uh, didn't want also uh, that it became public that uh, from their family uh, uh, family members suffered uh, this uh, a disease uh, such a disease and so it was a taboo until uh, today and it is a taboo uh, until today uh, as a uh, polacas here in uh, Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil also. Uh, uh, and we rebuilt, Andreas and uh, I, we rebuilt such a grey uh, bus in concrete and, it, uh, and put it in one blocks the entrance of a clinic where the patient came out, uh, uh, was transported um, by these buses. And we made a second one and this second one uh, travels around through Germany, through Europe, all the ways to these clinics, to these places of, and there it's written, where do you bring us? It is a quotation of one of the patients. And it comes and goes, uh, and uh, there's always a bus station. It is installed as a bus station, and when the bus goes, then, uh, often uh, uh, the bus station with the information uh, uh, about the stops stays and uh, sometimes uh, the bus can come again to the same place. Here it is in front of Berlin, here you have the same as uh, we experienced uh, uh, here in Sao Paulo. Uh, the Estasao de la Pinacoteca, the tops building, it's always, it seems to be sometimes the same history, the same story. Uh, art should uh, heal, what's that, heal? Heal. Heal, heal the wounds, uh, uh, the wounds, uh, so they here in the tops building, they established uh, a museum also, and there's wonderful art, and, uh, but uh, we have to think if uh, perhaps it is also as, um, a method uh, to forget than to remember. And here there was the administration, the Villa T4, the administration center for this mass murder, but they built the Philharmonia on the same uh, place and it was completely forgotten. And there was an overlapping of the former administration villa by the Nazis with an, a new build by Sharon Philharmonia with Warenbäumen. So you have the uh, best uh, cultural um, music and the best cultural what the humanity uh, can produce. And, on the same place where they produced the baddest uh, administration, the baddest thing of humanity. So, next one. It's the next. Yes, you can. Uh, 
And this is always a convoy. It needs that we close roads like we did uh, two months ago in Frankfurt. We had to close the inner city. <laughs> Uh, the board uh, was not uh, available, uh, so it is an 80 ton uh, monument that get moved uh, more or less once uh, a year uh, with a big autocran um, and it uh, now has already moved for 7,000 kilometers, 80 ton heavy. And uh, this uh, wonderful castle uh, behind on the top of the hill, it is um, uh, one of the six uh, patient mass murder uh, areas that is a kind of exterritorial, exterritorial place where the Nazis, uh, how Horst already mentioned, started the mass murder. Yes, then there was uh, 93, the competition uh, for the monument of the uh, murder Jews uh, of Europe. And um, here uh, I did a projection uh, from the Auschwitz gate onto the Brandenburg gate, that means yeah, the Germans uh, used the Brandenburg Gate as a new national symbol after the reunification. Uh, but you should never forget that uh, the Germans built other gates uh, too. And you have, uh, and here both, it was a Memorial Day, 27th of January, when uh, for one night both uh, uh, gates uh, uh, became. Uh, one image. Then, must write that? Yes, and my proposal was uh, for the Holocaust Memorial to uh, uh, to uh, blow up or uh, to crush the Brandenburg Gate uh, and to uh, spread out the remains, uh, the rests onto the site for the memorial, so that you have to stand two empty voids, two voids, two empty places, the national symbol and, uh, 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 and the memorial place. Of course, they threw me, they kicked me out in the first round of the uh, uh, competition as a provocation, but uh, this uh, work became international famous because it means you can do whatever you want, you never we can uh, find a metaphor, a metaphor uh, for the Holocaust, even if you blow up the Brandenburg, uh, the Brandenburg Gate. Uh, we can do it always only wrong, uh, uh, doing memorials. We never get uh, the history back. The only thing is artists, we can do it more or less wrong. But normally we tell, uh, uh, doing monuments, we tell much more about our time, uh, uh, our style, uh, our problems, uh, than about the victims and the past. Next one. Okay, then I'll go with Eva Swalde. So the same is uh, when we uh, was invited to another competition in Eberswalde. This is a small town, uh, about 50,000 inhabitants, uh, some one hour uh, in north from Berlin. And this shows the remaining, the only remaining parts of a former synagogue that was burned in uh, 1938 in the so-called Reichskristallnacht. But this photo is from uh, some years before when a flash uh, hits the uh, the building and uh, the synagogue burned. And, uh, but all of the neighbors, the fire workers, and everyone came to help uh, to uh, fight against the fire. But only some years later, in the so-called Reichskristallnacht, 
uh, probably the same neighbors or the same um, <laughs> uh, people or some of them um, put the synagogue uh, under fire and it was totally destroyed. The Jewish community has uh, to remove every remains of the building on their own costs. And so the building was gone until 2012 when Horst and I, we came up with our um, design to trying to find the, the remains of the foundation because we, uh, our, uh, we, we were sure that there is something. And so really we, we could, and everyone told us, no, it's completely away, destroyed in a way, but no, on the point, we could find it. Here you see the corner, and that's, that's here's the building again. It's almost 80% uh, of the foundation. So we w could went on with our concept that we designed in theory, um, to um, remark the the place, and so the foundation you can see it there in the ground. The foundation uh, carry their own memorial, and this is a wall. This is a wall, 80 meters all in all, a wall that has no window, has no door, and no entrance, nothing. Uh, only uh, some sentences going around. It invites you to go around, and we close. We we remark. We we um, uh, we show the hiatus. We show the the lack, the space, the emptiness, the loss of uh, community, of people, of culture in that city. We show exactly that place and wait until something happened in in the, in the inner part so that's the day we closed the sculpture leaving just one tree uh, where the chapala was and the torah and um, after this uh, so this is from last summer maybe two uh, two or three months ago it's growing that high. So the longer the destruction is uh, behind us, uh, the bigger the monument grows. It's growing. This we call it growing memory. That means in double sense, you grow, yourself grow also with uh, knowledge and uh, and all of this because. We are all children of what happened, not depending on which uh, history, whether it's the military dictatorship or the um, mass murder on psychiatric ill persons or Jews. So we are, we all of us, we are all children of what happened. And uh, so in the, in the front of the uh, monument, we have a sentence written. This is a psalm that uh, more or less has the meaning of that you should stand up and tell your children. So this is wonderful. And so you can go on, you stand up, tell your children that they can tell their children that they can and so on. And that's what uh, what this memorial especially wants to show up. This is a developing thing. Yeah. Always growing, losing leaves, uh, carrying some fruits. It's a totally wilderness there. Yes, but uh, Eberswalde, this town is in East Germany. And some people there got angry because there come uh, two artists from West Germany and built again a wall where nobody can enter. <laughs> that was a problem we didn't know before that could uh, that could happen. 
Uh, here the Nazis uh, burned uh, uh, the books in uh, May 10th, uh, 1933. And we uh, were where we won a competition in the uh, in Bonn uh, to mark this place in front of the university and in front of the city hall again exactly where the Nazis burned the books. So we casted uh, some uh, 60 books or 70 books in bronze with the titles and the uh, forbidden. Uh, censored authors, and together with the uh, uh, people, uh, we collocated the, uh, there on the uh, on the uh, on the floor. Yes, and to mark the place, but we uh, uh, constructed underneath a small archive uh, with a, w a waterproof uh, case. And uh, we put original books inside, so they, this is the center of this installation, and they are uh, there uh, all the year. But my tents with the mayor and with students in a performance, we open uh, or they open it, and there's uh, then always a big, uh, uh, yes, a big. Uh, crowd of uh, people and uh, there are quotations <laughs> yes here's the video for one of this memorial days the mayor takes out uh, the case and opens it And this is sponsored by antiquariats and bookshops. And and we give it to the passersby, to the people, so the book go back to the bookshelves of the city, in the apart into the apartments. And then we fill it again, so it is a annual ritual. Maxim Gorki, die Feinde. Mayakowski, Werke, Gedichte. Und Egon Erwin Kisch, Nächte, Kinder, Abenteuer. Und jetzt habe ich mehr Bücher, als die Kiste trägt, also haben wir für die nächsten Jahre auch noch Bücher. <lacht> And on the plate, you have all the names of the authors. Yes, so we jump to the Sao Paulo. Uh, Marcelo Araujo, the former director of the Pinacoteca, asked us uh, to do, to commemorate uh, the portal of the former Chiradentes prison. And our idea was to rebuild it. You know, you have the Kaisha in the background. This, you know this. Next. Yes, our idea was to rebuild it as a cage, as a jaula uh, de pasaro, the cage of birds, and put inside a tropical, wonderful, colorful birds of Brazil. But IBAMA, what, what is the organization, uh, didn't allow this. Uh, so we had to work with pigeons, with messenger pigeons. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, so we put as prisoners uh, these pigeons uh, uh, into the portal. And the guards of the museum had to take care and to feed them. 
and uh, every end on the walls around the next. We put the old photos, from police photos from the students. And the, this is uh, and the former students, now uh, adults or now uh, members of the society here is Philippe uh, Freire, uh, Alipio Freire, yes? Alipio Freire, uh, they every Saturday uh, they showed the people around the village that uh, told their experience in this prison and explained a lot of the history of the story and at the end they released one pigeon from the balcony of the uh, Pinacoteca. This was always a very emotional moment and at the end uh, of the exhibition uh, the howler, uh, the cage uh, uh, was empty and open. Yes, that was this project. And now, uh, from uh, uh, Chimica de la Memoria. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, and here is, uh, I try often to work because here this, the history is not my my history. Uh, so I try to work as a catalyst sometimes. And so in Buenos Aires, uh, I asked people to bring objects which uh, for them has to do something with the dictatorship, with the time of the dictatorship. So we got a collection of 100 or 200, in the meantime it's growing and growing, this collection of objects and people brought their objects, but it was very important uh, by the object they taught each other, they discussed uh, their stories, their, their histories. And uh, so at, at the end, we, in the Biblioteca Nacional, we presented all this object like a museum shop. It was on the entrance uh, installed like a museum shop and people entered and then uh, they were confronted not with, uh, uh, with things uh, to buy or to sell, it was uh, this, uh, this object, it worked very well until the moment when one of uh, the participants uh, came with a plastic gun, with a Kalashnikov in, in plastic. And then the other told uh, that, no, if here uh, in this collection appears a weapon, I will uh, reach... Uh, I will, will take out my uh, my object. I will not uh, that here appears. And then we decashed because they wanted only present victims. But it was a militant conflict. The weapons weapons belonged to this conflict. But now in the memory, they uh, they wanted to turn it only uh, on the side of the victims. And there we had a very hard discussion. And at the end, uh, uh, they accepted uh, the weapon. And they asked me, "How? Uh, hey, but you have to bring an object too. And I told them, uh, no, not my uh, history, but I, I will bring an uh, object. And then I brought a small, I participated with a small case and uh, the other opened it and it was empty. There was only written, I participate with, a empty, with this empty uh, box because this history is not my history. That uh, was, uh, but uh, then it uh, traveled to uh, Rosario to the Museo de Arte de, de la Memoria in Rosario and in, uh, uh, and in Uruguay also. So it is a process now. But I am, and in the ESMA, uh, they do it also. It was my uh, idea as a catalyst, but I am uh, now completely out of the process. Nobody mentioned uh, me any, and I like this. So that's. It's Rodrigo, so. Bueno, ahora vamos a seguir en castellano. Eh, eh, yo no traje imagen, pero el trabajo es, es el tipo de trabajo como se aborda el, 
es prácticamente el mismo que se hizo en Argentina, pero en Chile, invitados por la profesora Schimferker, de Berlín, y el proyecto consistía prácticamente en lo mismo, en que cada uno de los participantes trajera un objeto, el cual lo relacionara con el tiempo de la dictadura o del golpe de Estado. Eh, nosotros tuvimos la intención en un principio de juntar tanto el grupo de estudiantes como en la periferia eh, personas de San Bernardo. No fue posible porque los estudiantes no quisieron. Y bueno, fuimos primero a San Bernardo y el tipo de objeto fue otro, absolutamente diferente. Eh, y la situación cambia radicalmente en relación a lo que eh, se vio en Buenos Aires. Eh, fueron eh, objetos personales relacionados con su familia, con sus hijos, básicamente, porque prácticamente yo diría que el 80% eran mujeres. Y eh, la verdad que cuando empezaron a relatar, empezaron a caerse las lágrimas a, la, a las madres, eh, nosotros estábamos un poco así expectantes a ver qué pasa y, y la señora Schimpfer, Schimpfer, que trataba de siempre introducir el tema del golpe de Estado, de la dictadura, pero la verdad es que no fue posible. Y eh, fueron relatando, después fueron otras madres relatando también eh, su situación y tú te das cuenta que la contingencia que ellos vivían, la pobreza, era tan fuerte que era imposible. La verdad es que nosotros de un principio ya descartamos la posibilidad de tratar el tema. Eh, si es que llegaba, llegaba, o si no, seguimos con el cuento y fue la verdad que una especie de catarsis eh, de todos, todos, prácticamente todos lloramos. Y lo terrible de todo esto es que eh, en el fondo estas madres, estas, estas madres trataban de de ver un futuro, de no repetir esta situación con sus hijos o sus hijas, que sus hijas quedaran embarazadas, qué sé yo, que las llevaba a, a esta misma situación. Y tú veías que la verdad es que es muy difícil salir de, de, de este círculo. Y más o menos es un poco para enganchar lo que hablamos nosotros, ¿te acuerdas ahora para el, la muestra, cuando se habló de, de que se debería de... Eh, cómo llevar este tema hacia la periferia. Y cuando te encuentras con problemas muy fuertes, una violencia muy fuerte. Y la verdad es que no se pudo abordar. Yo hice un proyecto después, como un año después, esto ha sido el 2000 más o menos, ¿no? Y el 2001, cuando cayeron las Torres Gemelas, yo hice un proyecto con eh, muchachos de, 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 la zona, de la misma zona, de la zona sur de Santiago, eh, porque hubo un concurso que el ferrocarril del Estado tenía el problema que chicos de la periferia lanzaban piedras a los ferrocarriles y eh, querían ver la manera de abordar el tema y de solucionarlo. Y yo planteé eh, la idea de simplemente viajar con ellos, que ocuparan el tren. Y así fue, hicimos un viaje, se trataba también de, artist, de un, un proyecto artístico que no iban a pintar y qué sé yo, pero básicamente era la experiencia con el tren porque al final nos dimos cuenta que ellos nunca habían viajado en el tren, nunca habían tenido esa experiencia. Y la verdad es que fue muy enriquecedor y yo creo que en base a ese tipo de cosas uno puede introducirse en, 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 en esos lugares, digamos, que son de periferia, de delincuencia y de extrema pobreza. Bueno, ahora pasaría a lo otro, Andreas. Bueno, eso, el, lo que, esto pertenece al pasado, pertenece al pasado eh, y ahora esto es un proyecto que tenemos hacia futuro con Andreas Horst, y, que es el tema de la Villa Baviera, que fue un enclave eh, alemán, que fue un, eh, una colonia, ellos hicieron una especie de comunidad, eh, por Paul Schaeffer, que un alemán que estuvo peleando en la Segunda Guerra Mundial, estuvo en las juventudes eh, eh, nazis, eh, lo cual no es algo raro, ¿eh? Eh, es algo, era, era muy común de que prácticamente todos participaran de las juventudes en esa época, de las juventudes nazis. 
él llegó a ser una especie de cabo, eh, fue creo que enfermero, y eh, después él empezó a meterse al tema eh, de la comunidad religiosa, evangélico, y él eh, era como una especie de ayudante, era, era laico, hasta que tuvo problemas eh, de pedofilia, o sea, el tipo era pedófilo. Tuvo que arrancarse, fue a, otra, a, otra, a otras comunidades y siguió con el tema. Y al final eh, decidió irse. Pero el tipo tenía suficientemente capacidad de, conven de convencer eh, como para... Se llevó como 100 familias más o menos a Chile. Y básicamente eh, al principio se llevó a, a niños y los cuales no... En algunos casos no juntó a la familia, digamos, él se quedó con los niños. Eso, él llegó en el año 61, más o menos. Este señor vivió prácticamente, antes del golpe de Estado, vivió tres gobiernos democráticos en Chile, más eh, el, la dictadura y parte ya de, con Elwin, la, la reinserción a la democracia. Eh, ellos estuvieron siempre, desde un principio de que llegaron a Chile, eh, ingiriéndose en la política, eh, eh, preparando grupos eh, de derecha, de extrema derecha, y eh, tuvieron siempre muy buena relación con eh, tanto la policía como las Fuerzas Armadas, desde un principio. O sea, no es una cosa que salió en 1973, vino el golpe de Estado y ellos de repente aportaron su granito de arena, eh, sino que era una relación de, de, que ellos eh, la trabajaron desde un principio. Eh, bueno, él, en la secta, eh, él, él, tenía, él, él era un predicador, o sea, mezclaba el tema de religión con el, 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 todo el tema de político que iban a venir, creo que iban a venir los cubanos y los rusos, les tenía todo y, un un lavado de cerebro, y eh, lo otro que hizo es separar las familias. Él separó eh, hombres y mujeres, separó adultos de menores. Y para poder eh, seguir, porque en el fondo esta comunidad extrañamente tenía como último fin él mismo. O sea, como que no era una comunidad con un futuro determinado, sino que era, era él mismo el que tenía que a, eh, poder acceder a su, a su, a su, al, tema de la, al tema de la pedofilia. Eh, pasaron los años y llegó el golpe y él eh, ofreció, ella tenía los contactos y fue a un lugar de, de confinamiento, de tortura y de desaparición. Eh, se supone que ahí hay un contacto por algunos testigos que escucharon cuando estaban en, en tortura eh, portugués. Y de ahí se presupone que eh, había un contacto con Brasil. Eh, eh, se supone que los eh, soldados brasileros eh, portaban conocimiento para el tema de la tortura. Y eh, de hecho ahí, según una de las, de las víctimas que sobrevivió, eh, ella tenía la sensación de que estaban probando. No era... Eh, eh, la finalidad matarlos en un principio sino que probar técnicas de tortura bueno ahí hubieron varios casos por ejemplo ahí que lo que se hizo es legalizar la muerte como de 100 personas que fue en el año 75 donde se hizo una gran matanza en el Cerro Gallo que está en la zona creo que un poco más hacia el, hacia el norte de la de Colonia Dignidad pero muy pegado a Colonia Dignidad y ya acercándonos al tiempo de, de la democracia, eh, ellos tuvieron que ya se empezaron a preparar para ver qué, qué iban a hacer si cambiaba el, el, la orientación política, digamos, del país. Y como a partir, no fue de inmediato, sino que a partir del 90, 91, ya empezaron las, las querellas. El, no sé el año exacto, pero tengo anotado ahí, pero da igual, como el 94 creo que hubieron las deserciones eh, masivas de, y acusaciones por 25 niños eh, por graves eh, abusos. Y 
Y eso continuó hasta que el 2000, diferentes querellas por diferentes motivos, eh, también por eh, evasión de impuestos y todos esos temas. Y otro, ah, otra cosa, que, o sea, ahí se mezclan muchas cosas, se mezclan temas de la política y temas de, eh, de delincuencia. Ahí se, se, se tiene más o menos claro que hubo eh, venta de armas hacia, ilegal hacia otros países. ¿Ah? Y, y que se, crea, se crearon también armamentos ahí. Eh, también se experimentó con gasarín y con una serie de... Bueno, eh, bueno pasando al, ya al tema del de tiempo democrático, empezó a haber una serie de querellas. Parte de eso era el tema del armamento, parte era, era el tema del, del, de la evasión de impuestos, parte era, o sea, era un, un cerro de querellas, el tema de la, de la pedofilia. Y él, arranca, él se arranca el 2000, a ver, espérate, no, el 79, cuando ya lo están, el, 80, a ver, el 97, cuando ya lo están acosando legalmente. Y se va, presumiblemente, que en realidad se fue, a Argentina. Lo empezaron a buscar y estuvo como cinco años prácticamente, o ocho años, eh, que no lo ubicaron. Hubo señales de que estuvo, se supone que fueron maniobras distractivas para que no lo ubicaran, hasta que un, un, eh, un programa de televisión chilena, de investigación, lo ubicó en, a las cercanías de, de Buenos Aires. O sea, ni la policía argentina, ni la policía chilena, ni tampoco Alemania hizo nada para poder ubicar a este personaje. Y así él estuvo preso o sea, un mes o algo así en Argentina, fue llevado, repatriado a, a Chile, allí lo, le, empezaron con todas las querellas, los juicios, estaba preso, y el, el 2005, 2006, 2005 lo toman preso, y el 2006 empiezan ya todos los juicios, y este señor muere el 2010, que ahí se acaba su parte de la historia. Nosotros fuimos... Pues, caso, Peter, bueno, nosotros eh, cuando estuvimos aquí, fuimos a Chile y fuimos a, a entrevistar a mucha gente que estuvo, los, eh, la gente que estuvo internada, presa ahí, y familiares que perdieron eh, gente en, en Villa Baviera. Que es como muy raro, porque nosotros fuimos para allá el año pasado y es un lugar idílico en realidad, de una belleza impresionante. Tú estás ahí y ves los cerros, todo verde, o sea, la zona de Chile esto es verde. Y claro que por ti pasan todas estas, todas estas historias truculentas y, y, y donde, donde hablaba antes que se, donde se mezclan todas estas situaciones y te encuentras también con... Eh, es como algo extraño, te encuentras con una Alemania que en Alemania no existe. Te encuentras con... Nosotros vimos pasar por ejemplo una mujer en bicicleta, una señora ya mayor... Eh, vestida como después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial o, o durante. Y después nos encontramos, también fue una casualidad, algo muy extraño, con un cuidador que eh, este es... Claro, que era... Él eh, era como una especie de cuidador, pero era el... el el yerno, era el yerno, el yerno de, 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 de Schaeffer, el que estaba con... Él no era la hija de Schaeffer, era una, una, una adoptada, adoptiva, hija adoptiva. Y este señor empezó a hablar de, de lo que había pasado, que era muy terrible, como tirando para atrás, pero no todos eran así y ahora había cambiado. Y después nos informamos, poco tiempo después, que este señor fue uno de los que estuvo en Argentina cuidándolo. Era una especie de, de guarda o de, de seguridad, claro. Y no, a nosotros la impresión que tuvimos es que un poco seguía el, la misma historia, o sea, no exactamente la misma historia, pero esa, esa cosa como cerrada de, de Villa Baviera. Esto con, con, el, con la llegada de la democracia, cuando ya se fue Paul Schaeffer, un porcentaje alto, yo creo que más el 50% se fueron. Unos quedaron en Chile y otros se fueron a Alemania. Pero ellos nunca pudieron eh, reinsertarse, en su gran mayoría. Hubieron algunos casos, pero muy contados, pero en su gran mayoría no, ni en Chile ni en Alemania. Porque ellos estaban, eh, ellos vivían en, en las condiciones tales que... Muito 
Obrigado, Flávia. Sou o Márcio Seligman. Márcio Seligman. E é um honor estar aqui com você, artistas, pessoas que eu admiro muito, que têm seus trabalhos ao redor do mundo, e lidar com esse assunto da preparação artística, da memória associada com a ação. That sometimes it has to do with an attempt to write memories that hasn't been written or that's been written in a very fine line. And also the 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 problem of the memory that memories are constructions but are political constructions. So they work in a political line in this relationship of building the memory and the present moment as Horst emphasized, like those anti-monuments or memorials, as you want to call it. It has to do with our present, not with the past. We have no positivist uh, illusion that we can bring back uh, the past. The Memory Act happens in the present because a demand we have in the present. And they go back, like for example, when they come to Latin America, they've done work in Brazil and Argentina and now in Chile, building those works that, and, and as, as catalyzers, as Rahosh said, to elaborate the memory. And it's important to say that in Latin America, not only in Africa, Asia, and many countries that's been through conflicts like dictatorships, torture, and everything. They, after the Second World War, they've been marked by this memory elaboration because of what they've been through. And that's a strength that they've had. Works like Horst and Andreas. They are Getz, Shalev Getz, all their artists, and many other artists that work with this issue, especially from Shua. And they developed a policy, a political uh, a, a policy of how to think this past. And I want to think about how can we think about it today in Brazil? Because it, have to, it, it was built a constellation in the preview in the past few years in Brazil that allows this kind of intervention. I remember I spoke when I invited Horst and Andreas the first time in 2001 uh, at Goethe Institute, and it was about those issues. And at that time in Brazil, it was very incipient to this kind of movement. It was something very new. People didn't know what an anti-monument was. So they came it and then presented it, and they started planting this seed here because they came back. They had a wonderful exhibition at Maria Antonia, and then they came back to Pinacoteca. They did the exhibition at Lazar Segal. So they established a dialogue, and I think that there's a, a growth in Brazil, of course, Building the memory of the Holocaust was a process. In 1970, there wasn't the term Holocaust to denominate the mass murders in Europe. Like in the 80s, we established Shoah, that was it's been used, the term that's been used lately. The memory of evil, the history of evil, is something that it is built throughout time. And of course, elaborating, the artistic elaboration has a very important role. There's an example that I really like, and it's very clear, Guernica. Who hasn't heard about Guernica? Because of Picasso's painting. Everybody knows Guernica because of the painting. It was a horrible thing. It was bombardment made by Germans. It killed 150 people. Is it horrible? Yes. But what about the bombardment in Dresden? 100,000. It's an absurd number. Castle. All those bombardments 
we don't have this universal memory. There's no Guernica for them. So the power of Picasso, that he does his work, which is genius, and he builds a mark of memory. It's an ethical mark of memory. There's also the, an issue that goes behind the Guernica. Since when he painted it, it's still a monument against the war, against this kind of violence that marked the 20th century. So we see how art can be can have an influence in building memory. I gave you a radical example, but there we have several. If you go to concentration camps that they are they are now memorials today, we've lived a work of artistic elaboration. Even in Buchenwald, we have this sign from Horst. They still have a monument from the DDL time. And the money used to man monumentalize that time. It's like uh, something that had nothing to do with that that uh, space. But that was the ethics and the aesthetics when that thing was built. So this work that they have is a uh, it was built. It has a construction that is a lot more. It, it constitutes in a building a memory work, remembrance. They don't want only to memorize as a monument, in a monumental way. They want to put in action this memory uh, movement. As Andreas explained so well with the temperature of the plate, you remember Robert Rantel, which is a survivor of that concentration camp. Isabel, uh, it's called the human species. So they try to animalize us, but we are human. And everybody who made us suffer and those who were suffered, they are, we are humans. So the contradiction of the humanity. On the other hand, here in Brazil, we've had an opening for this. And I'd like to propose in a very brief way in this space that I have here. We want to think about this. That's something that has to do with the movement of our getting away of the dictatorship, but that's an official date that may be criticized, but that's the date that we have. The end of the dictatorship was in 85, and how long we took to have our, our truth commission as we were talking on Saturday at Stasson Pinacoteca. It was the last country in Latin America who opened for these issues because of international pressures. But on the other hand, this movement of building this commission and opening a debate in Brazil or get a line to a debate that was established at that time, you can see in the artists a generation, a younger generation, like the exhibition that we had on Saturday. We represent. We had two people, two young artists represented by Jaime Laureano and Clara Yani, and they have a relationship with Brazilian history that is different from ours. It's like they haven't lived what the previous generation, which is mine, that we suffered. Uh, uh, a brainwash. I studied during the dictatorships. I studied through the all the national myths. And he, this young artist, he kind of destroys the the the, the flag monument because it was, and he rebuilds it with um, blank with, with blanks from the from the guns. So it changes our heroic uh, memory. So this new generation has a different view. They have a maybe more critical view, and they've been making very interesting work. And of course, we have the moment, the Holocaust, as uh, a, how the term was coined. It was in the 70s. So there's a time to elaborate the memory, to build the memory. That's something that's happening here in Brazil, late as it normally happens. Like 
people are getting older, those who live these experiences, they want to write, they want to s tell the stories to their sons and grandsons. It's a passage of generations. We're talking about to, uh, past memory in mnemonic studies. So the generations are disappearing, so we need to, to pass on the memory to the new generations. How we can make it carry on. If you think about Sao Paulo, we just launched the exhibition on Saturday, the day before they opened uh, Levantes in Sesc Pinheiros with the uh, curatorship of George Huber Huberman, and then there's a, we have the curator here, Vigio Brasil, which has a, a, as an axe, and it's related to the history. I was, a, I was invited to talk to them about this. So we have a, a guidance, the curators and the artists, in order to reply, respond to this demand, rethink this history, how to build a, his, a critical history, how to build uh, the history of dictatorship that is not the official history that's still uh, dominant. Especially in the media in Brazil, the economic miracle, the necessary evil, that's what they call it, when they say that, of course, there was a, a halt in the democracy and that was necessary. They say that if we didn't have the coup d'etat, the communist would invade the country and conquer the country. So every time we try to, to criticize, uh, they say, we saved Brazil against the communists. They, they didn't save Brazil, they established a dictatorship. They were active, that they were, weren't responding anything. They were creating a dictatorial space for a capitalist uh, and all dictatorships in Latin America. They were capitalists. They, they followed the, the Cold War. It started there. And they built the dictatorship together with the elites. And the military were co-actors. They weren't the main actors. So those artists, they, they should see this in a very clear way. And the exhibition that we have now, one of Marcelo Brodsky's uh, work on the Argentine artist. He proposed a, a work called Terra Brasilis. He built three maps and according to what he, he sees in Brazil, what he's been seen in Brazil, the first map, it's the Terra Brasilis maps from the 16th century. We can see the, his intervention using Debré's work and he brings the day-to-day -day life, the torture and the pain of the slaves. And the other two maps, they were copied from Yepi's collection. One of them was done during the dictatorship in the 70s. And he puts small labels with the name of many of the companies that were actors during the dictatorship, and also before, when they were preparing for the dictatorship. He writes down the name of the companies and the type of involvement they had. Clara Yanni, she has two works. One of them is about this issue, this corporate cooperation, especially about Volkswagen. So we have an uh, um, advertising picture for 1964. Okay, there's a picture from 59 with no, with no car, and on 64 there's the same, the same house with a car in the garage. So now everybody has a car in their garage, and on the bottom, uh, you have to go there to see it. He found the document in one of the newspapers archives, and it was a document the internal security 
report written in a DOPS um, paper uh, letterhead. So how they were spying on on Volkswagen's workers. We can see this kind of complicity in this exhibition. The same thing happens at the exhibition in Saski Pompeia. There's a, a work from Diego, I'm sorry, Rafael. We have two. One that I found very interesting was about uh, the Holy Spirit. And we had this issue of San Marco, the accident that we had in Minas. He has a very simple idea, and he raised all the, the, the advertising during the dictatorships, during the dictatorship, and we have a dialogue between Brodsky's work and this Raphael works, and they didn't, they didn't communicate. And all the advertisement, they were thanking all the generals that were presidents in Brazil. So the relationship were like very, very corporate and very, very close between businessmen and the dictatorship and all the advertising that we had during that time. So you, it, it's in all the archives. You have the, these documents are open. And I thought that that was a very interesting work. Makes us rethink the construction of history and these artists first they illuminate us in a different way it's different from a historian it's different from a journalist they use their imagination they create a mnemonics device with the very high critical thinking and it has the capacity to shock us so now people we are living through uh, such a conservative uh, moment in our country that we don't accept art being shocked. And, the, the, and art is made to shock because it, it gives you a different light on our identities. Since the romanticism, it builds our, our, our frontier between the, the individual and the public space. When I was thinking about what I was going to talk to you, I, I was talking about I was thinking about talking about Walter Benjamin, and there's an essay from 1929, and it's called Surrealism, uh, and it's a text that I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm going to remind you how important it is. The exhibition of Didi Uberman that you can see in Saski Pinheiros. I imagine, I didn't talk to him because there were a thousand people trying to talk to him. But he was influenced by this text and Abi Vabog. It's Vaburgi, Vaburgian work because it does like some kind of curatorship. Uh, he built an enormous panel with all the actions of uh, it's about the revolution uh, it happens during the revolution during the the war times and it's still going on according to Didi Uberman he works with his pictures as well on Je de Pomme in France he exposes pictures in Paris and he works with pictures uh, I say that he has to do with this Benjamin tax because Benjamin talks about the need of not thinking art as a misunderstanding of art by art. He says that art by art is rarely taken as literal. It's always been a flag where uh, there is a merchandise that's been Selling around. It's a merc you mercantilize art. It's an art to be sold. So, and art for Benjamin, and I agree with him that you have a political face always. And this art that we are finding nowadays in those exhibitions, I think they 
they take this place as this political position. Another point that I want to remind you, a concept that he develops is the idea of image space. Say that we need to organize our, our thinking. Uh, the pessimism, we have to organize our pessimism. Organize, organizing pessimism means extirpate the metaphor, the political metaphor, and find out in this political action a complete space for image. We need to build a space for image. And also, this space is a yeah, this, this relationship between art, building the image space. It's a body art, because art for Beijing is the art that we see today. It's more performatic. It's not only uh, something representing the reality. And I also think art as a technique, and I think it's something very up to date. And I'll let you not think about what you say, because especially when the body and the space of image is, uh, penetrate this nature so deeply that all tensions, all revolutionary tensions, will become nerves in the collective body. And those, and everything will be revolutionary. And with that, we have the reality uh, overcoming the <laughs> The, uh, the 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 level desired by the communist manifest so the art must be harmless it's art by art but we need to overcome this with the vanguard with benjamin there was the the philosopher of the aesthetics of vanguards and by these artists I see that through the romantic, uh, post-romantism, we have a conflict between this trend of art by art and this new trend, as you said, that comes from Goya. It's an art that it's so powerful as art, as imagination. How much imagination you needed to build or rewrite history? I mean, we're talking about Goya, all this disparatus and this art there's the inscription of terror that it's about the violence that marks the modernity and i think it it goes against the art by art it's a conflict that is always there it's go not be there always and it's a, pol a political moment that we have right now art is taking uh, a place as art in the space of action, because it's managing to open our eyes to many issues that were asleep. <clears throat> Art enlighten us. Da. Now I'd like to thank you. And I'd like to open for questions and answers, comments, anything that you want. I always have a question, so. I'd like to thank the round table, everybody part of it, everybody who's been here, this kind of intimate space of reflection. I'm gonna ask a question for Marcio because he was the last one to talk. So it's a I'm provoking. You you mentioned Kant art by art from the definition on from the eighteenth century, then you passed by Benjamin. I've been reading and there are a lot of people that, are, that have been mentioning Hansière and the political art by Hansière, and he's been criticizing the vision of political art, the conception of visual uh, political art that's very direct. There are some works infantilize the 
the audience because they're too obvious. And in reality, I think we are leaving this moment of engagement, but I'm pretty scared with some works and curatorship, but there's the need to explain the work, why the work must have a subtitle. That scares me, it's just a comment, more than anything. And what I see is the other side. It's like we are throwing the singularity art away in order to infantilize the audience. And sometimes we are not talking enough about art, the mater materiality of art, as you mentioned, Benjamin, this, how, how you make its core bodily. How can you, how can you, how can you come up with these languages, the monument, the anti-monument? Those have uh, different works, their repertoire are very different with a familiarity very, very strong. And it allows them to have an answer, a different answer when you talk about it in the real life. And it doesn't infantilize anyone. If you think about Horst, Andreas, and Rodrigo's work, we, it's hard to build meanings. And I, I miss this in some works that I see nowadays. This non-infantilization. We are not childs anymore. In reality, what she's saying for me is, uh, is just adding to what I was talking about. You raised uh, a question as I was talking that, according to Bajman, that's art, it's not art of representation. The art that infantilizes, it's the, the, the art that represents the political, the cheap political art. Benjamin also goes against this type of official art, the communist art that ha was happening in his time. It wasn't his ideal. And art, if art is always political, why must be like, uh, cheap political art. You don't have to do it that way because you want to, to, to teach. When art, you have to open to a different uh, view. The, all the, the hard work that you need in order to art to exist. Benjamin also talked about the end of aura of the contemplation. And this very distracted reception. Sometimes this distracted reception is not uncommitted. It's still committed. But there's something that I will allow myself to separate myself from what you mentioned. Uh, subtitles. That's uh, a discussion, especially the exhibition. Uh, for example, D.D. Uberman's exhibition, there's no subtitle. So you see all the works, they look completely aestheticized as art by art, and that's impressive, because those are about fights. But since they don't have a subtitle, we don't know what they are about. Some do have, but they don't, we cannot, look, we cannot locate them in time and space. We have to research it, of course. Maybe that's his proposal, but the curatorship, sometimes they have to be careful because on the other hand, the opposite, as we were talking about Horse, the current documenta, which is a curatorship that wants to make everything political, uh, subtitle everything. Of course, I liked some of the work there, but sometimes the political proposal may suffocate the most important element of, of the art production, and which is building those enigmas, the, not something that will answer the, to a political issue. And again, we have the action art. 
It's also interesting. For example, I remember the action that Brodsky did in Fortaleza when he went to one of the biggest monuments to remember the, the <laughs> dictatorship is uh, is one of the generals' mausoleum. And the Argentina came and said, how can you, you bring homage to a dictator like that? So they, they built, they went there, they did a performance, they sang a song of a singer who was who died in Buenos Aires by the dictatorship. So it's an action art. I think it's interesting. I think the art is can can work. And and Brodsky is a performance, as everybody knows. Good morning. I'd like to first to to. Thank you. It was very interesting. I got, I was very interesting about your speech. My question is more like, uh, I really liked your work, but you brought all the, how, how those works are written, are, are read. In, okay. How, how, how are the, how, how, I, okay, it's not coming. Could could she? Okay, Rodrigo, you said that you were involved in this project. You talked about the contest, but what's the project? What are you gonna do? What are you thinking? What are you planning to do with this data that you have? And for the other two, I'd like to know Whether during creating the creative part, do you start the project doing some kind of, uh, of research with the neighborhoods of these areas? The, if the projects, they come from your studios or what's the relationship with the locations where the project will be developed? My name is Virginia. I am a professor at UFCSM. Primeira parte, os projetos. El espacio, las personas con las que tú te involucras, en las cuales tú visitas, son muy dispares, sobre todo en temas de derechos humanos. Están los grupos que han sido víctimas directas de lo que hablaba antes y gente que familiares han morido en, 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 en el transcurso de la dictadura y la posición que tienen ellos es muy diferente entre uno y otro. Los que fueron víctimas generalmente tienen una posición mucho más guerrera de ir hacia, hacia, hacia el conflicto y, y, y querellarse. Los otros, es el, las personas que han sufrido, buscan de poder acceder a los cuerpos de sus desaparecidos, poder darles una sepultura digna y también es, es más pasivo. La actitud, tú lo, tú lo notas, ¿sabes? cuando estás en las entrevistas, tú notas que hay, en uno hay una actitud mucho más pasiva y en el otro es, es mucho más activo. Y creo que eh, cuando, se da, cuando uno va a investigar, va a ver, te encuentras con esas situ diferentes situaciones del espacio mismo de, de la Colonia de Dignidad eh, que te están hablando. Y ellos en gran medida te determinan eh, cómo vas a abordar tú el, 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 el trabajo. Hay, por ejemplo, hoy en día la colonia de aparentemente, que no se sabe, está en malas condiciones económicas, pero supuestamente han ganado mucho dinero y no se sabe dónde está el dinero. Y eh, están vendiendo lotes, lotes, eh, están loteando, o sea, vendiendo parcelas, de estas típicas parcelas de agrados de media hectárea, qué sé yo, y una de las proposiciones que era justamente de Horst era comprar una y eh, establecer, establecer un, un diálogo, un lugar, un lugar de encuentro de las diferentes eh, eh, opiniones que hay dentro del, del y confrontar el, 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 el lugar con, con las personas, darles un, un, un espacio a la gente que no 
no pudo estar ahí, ni no pudieron buscar a sus, a sus seres queridos o que estuvieron ahí recluidos y, y torturados. Bueno, eh, este sería a veces nosotros, uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I, I speak English. Uh, yes, uh, some, uh, sometimes we like to uh, work also uh, subversive. So we offered, for example, in the best, in the uh, well-known newspaper, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, the uh, site for the Holocaust Memorial uh, for selling by the state, by the government. We made an uh, announcement there and all these uh, uh, companies who rebuilt the center after the reunification, the center of Berlin, they wanted to buy it. And they offered uh, us some, and at the end, uh, we uh, answered them, uh, thank you for your offer. With your offer, you are part of an artwork now. And we made an exhibition with all, uh, with all this. Uh, and uh, so we wanted to work in the same way, in perhaps in um, uh, the former Colonia Dignidad. Uh, but they are not allowed in the moment to sell these uh, uh, grounds. Uh, and, but I would like to work there in this uh, kind. Uh, but we have ideas not in the studio. We go together skiing or we are uh, in holidays with our families. And then we discuss uh, our project having a coffee in a restaurant and uh, we talk about it and then we do sports again and in the pauses we develop our ideas that's uh, 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 kind Andreas and me we work to, together and uh, uh, we discuss the ideas and uh, uh, and of course we visit these places we do research uh, but uh, the finally idea comes somewhere in some place having a coffee or under yeah or under the shower but not in the studio yes that's it the studio is everywhere <laughs> it's uh, it's up to you it's up to every one of us how can we uh, mobilize memory? How can we mobilize also by this society? So, and um, as I mentioned at the um, lecture two days before, art is a language. Art is a wonderful language. Also, like Marcio um, mentioned, the Benjamin um, ideas. And because of that, because we are able, we artists are able to talk in that language, we should go on. This is, this is our aim. That's why we are on, on the road, on the move. Like our monument, 80 ton monument is on the move. You can share it, you can borrow that. So it's playing with this. It's, it's, it's this infantile uh, playing with 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 things and and art and memory and because because of that language we are able what ah. uh -huh. because we are able to talk that language that's that's the issue we should go on we have to go on we have go to go on in in talking by that language and so the result is we are here again and again and again it's going on it's an ongoing process and that's why we are invited at that many countries this year Horst and I we went to Lithuania Kaunas where we took part we have a walk there in the Biennale we was this uh, May in Armenia and Turkey because we are doing a broke project there, it was super interesting 
thing, but now we stop, or we are stopped in a, in a way, or hesitate a little to go on with that project uh, between Armenia and Turkey, this conflict, uh, this very uh, terrible genocide there with the Armenians. And now, in November, we are invited to daily to a, a conference there, so we are all all over the world sharing our ideas, sharing our uh, language, or may may I go on with with that um, share <coughs> sharing that means learn multiplicators learn all of you in the, in, the, in the audience that language we try to like you also mentioned art uh, art is made to shock yeah <laughs> so we we can talk by this language uh, also about taboo themes more than the written things could do more than some scientists can do because the scientific uh, scientific thing is always quite narrow if you if you leave the i don't know the the rules you're out of that <laughs> you're out of that community and so art can do so many art can do a lot and because of this it should go on with that short commentary i don't know the english word but i think sometimes is a better language also of artists to tatamudiar in patamud gagizar uh, sometimes it's very important as artists to stottern uh, to gagizar also Não sei se eu devo falar em inglês, mas... Então, eu queria levantar essa questão do ressurgimento. Esse issue of the resurface of Nazis that you want artists, I don't, I cannot say your name, Horst. You talked about the resurface of Nazism. We've seen the resurface of the right wing here in Brazil as well. And the the rightist contesting art. I heard about the hooliganism that said that all the hooligans when they wanted to they they created those fights in England and they were they were looking to have a place in the media. And that's just an interpretation, but and I think that sometimes this Brazilian movement contesting art is a request. So they can be heard somehow because they are excluded in the artist pro uh, project. Okay, I'm a, a teacher of art and communication and I'd like to know if these people, do they manifest in, a, in as an anti-social movement are they forgotten? Especially nowadays in Brazil, there is a support for those rightists, a, a, a candidate that's ultra right. If people are getting, that people that are forgotten are people that are not still in the right, in the right wing. Because it's very recent in Brazil, this support to the rightists. And us as artists and communicators, philosophers, intellectuals, are you are we in a way forgetting part of the population? And the resurface of Nazis in Germany is this a, a, a mark of the human being? If you expect that this mark is going to disappear, does it will it disappear?
they want to they want to ask another question before you answer horse I think uh, there is it's a problem not only in Germany all over the world Desculpe é só o tempo eu sou I'm Luiz Galeão I'm a professor of social psychology psychology in the psychology institute here at the university and also social psychologists especially in my area we work with the day-to-day -day life and we work with the actual interaction in a place the site how important the site is and one of the things that I that I observed in your work of art is the importance of the location of the place the importance of the places that those are marks of memory milestones of memories and we have a discussion in a favela in Sao Paulo about the milestones or the places of memory memory how can you mark memory in the space and we've been working a lot with the uh, location, territory, and memory. So my question is regarding this. How do you make this relationship with the, the site, the location, and the importance of the location in building memory? I think I can see this in many, many of your work. The place where something happens, you have uh, memory, you create some, you create a mark. And to remind you that here, on the 30th, one of the few um, protests on the 30th of October, there's a walk to where Santo Dias uh, died. It was a factory worker who died. Today, the 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 plant is not there anymore. Is a building that is complaining about this protest. They, they're going to paint his name on the street because there's no mark, and then they will go to the cemetery. So one of the things that, that I observe is that the cemetery has places of memory, and some that start to have the marks relating the violation. Like Perus, we have that. It's a, we have a, a common tomb for, for the victims. And the importance of place, of the location to mark memory, and this reinterpretation of the location. So they can leave something that is understandable, but also mysterious for those who weren't in contact of what happened, like new generations. For example, having a plate or something in this location. As you mentioned, this space in Chile. I think it has to do with Marcio and the Benjamin idea of the cities and the existence within the cities. Thank you. Thank you. For, uh, yes, the site is very, very important. We work so that we first go to the site and we studied the site, and then the documents, and then the ideas come. So you see, we have not one style. There's a big monument about the gray buses moving uh, around 7,000 kilometers. At the other side, so you have the negative, the presence of the absence, uh, and uh, uh, the book burning is a site that's very important. Uh, so uh, it's not a style uh, we offer. Uh, the style comes from the site. Uh, so it's not as usually Picasso or, or Matisse, or you see the, that is a style and they use their style. Uh, but we work with the site and we, the ideas come conceptual out of the uh, of the situation of the of the site, but I work in my studio every day. I draw since thirty years, and I like this very much. But it is an other, uh, and I would uh, leave this mem memorial work and go back to art, pour art, uh, la polar, 
but as a late born uh, or after or the last year of the war born a German child, uh, I am a, more or less a prisoner. I can uh, not get out of this prison of German history. It takes, it keeps me prisoner and I try to get out by my drawings and so, but then I am sitting here and talking about sites uh, in Germany uh, of these Holocaust sites. And uh, that is uh, uh, very, very important uh, to mark uh, the site. And there was a, um, a process about cemeteries. The first Holocaust memorials have, uh, started in the cemeteries in Germany because the cemeteries are a neutral uh, memorial place. Everybody can uh, commemorate his victims without a great uh, political impact. And then in, after the 50s, uh, they came out to the parks, far away from the centers. And then they uh, it spent 60 years or 70 years uh, uh, to arrive that this uh, Holocaust memorials arrived in the center, now in the capital, besides the Brandenburg Gate uh, in Germany. Uh, but that is, that is also a risk, it's a danger now. Uh, that uh, now the politicians say, now we have the, this huge monument about the Holocaust, we have done our, uh, our guilt, uh, let's start with a new identity, with a heroic history uh, after the reunification, let's start new and now this, uh, Estela, this monument holds the uh, the history or, or covers the history and let's start you that's only a dangerous we are in Germany in this point now no eh, algo, quería comentar algo respecto a la, a la necesidad de la memoria porque por ejemplo eh, todo este conflicto que hay ahora en España con el tema de Cataluña de Cataluña eh, en parte en parte tiene justamente ese problema, que en España nunca se abordó. En España, eh, cuando hubo una especie de golpe de Estado, de hecho estábamos nosotros ahí en el 81, en, en febrero, creo que febrero del 81, eh, se llegó a un acuerdo. Nadie sabe que se llegó a un acuerdo, pero se, se llegó a un acuerdo y con todos los partidos políticos. Ahí estaban los comunistas, los socialistas, eh, los partidos independentistas, o sea, todos llegaron a un acuerdo en que no se iba a hablar más del tema, porque además se sabía o se tenía ya la idea de que en, próximamente iban a llegar los socialistas al poder. Y una de las condiciones para poder facilitar, allanar el camino, era justamente eso, no se habla más. Y el problema en Cataluña, una de las patas es que nunca se abordó. Y Cataluña fue un, hoy una comunidad autónoma eh, muy castigada eh, por la guerra, o sea, la última pelea fue en Aragón, la última batalla, pero Cataluña fue muy bombardeada, fue prohibido su lenguaje durante la dictadura de, de Franco. Y cuando tú no abordas eso, eh, pasan estas cosas. Pasa esto que, eh, y es extraño, porque en, en Cataluña es muy extraño, porque generalmente el, eh, ha sido la izquierda la que ha proclamado esta necesidad, pero los gobiernos catalanes en general, fuera de algunos pocos, ha sido de derecha. De hecho, el, el, el Jordi Puyol, que es como una especie de el rey de Cataluña, eh, él ha sido quien ha apoyado eh, el, los partidos gobernantes en, el, en, en Madrid, en el gobierno central. Entonces, eh, ahora, por ejemplo, tienen el tema que tuvieron un tema de corrupción, que han sido investigados justamente de Jordi Puyol por miles de millones, no estamos hablando de cifras pequeñas, son miles de millones de su familia, y están haciendo una huida hacia, hacia adelante, aprovechando esta extraña eh, comunión entre un partido que es de centro-derecha con esta extrema, porque es extrema izquierda, izquierda, extrema izquierda. ¿eh? No estamos hablando ni siquiera de partido socialista o partido comunista, sino que... Bueno, eso. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to remind you that Rodrigo lives in Barcelona. He was, his family was exiled, lives in Europe, and now he lives in, in, in Spain. 
memory as a work of art is site-specific. Memory is site-specific, according to, as Horst was mentioning. Before, how could you establish the relationship with imaging, narrative, and local? The art and memory is updated through the work of mourning. Mourning cemeteries, as you mentioned, is somewhere here people is memorialized. And it's, it becomes an issue of our l language. The, the word sema, which means signal, si sign, is the original sema is where the person is buried. That's a cultural center. And anthropologically speaking, is uh, the relationship with our ancestors. That's the mourning part. And that's part of those artists here who are developing this memory of violence. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, there's a problem all over the world that uh, there are so many forgotten groups in the different societies. Even in Germany, after the last elections, now we have this problem that uh, the right-wing party in one state uh, became uh, more powerful than the Christ Democrats. And uh, now uh, we are talking, discussion, we forgot a part of uh, the society. Groups of the society, they have uh, no, um, uh, uh, no speakers, no uh, representation uh, in the society, and we have to, uh, uh, to uh, give them uh, uh, a possibility to, uh, to come back because they are already outside a parallel uh, uh, group or society. And this is a problem we discuss, and I think that is in many other societies also. That's our experience, but it's always uh, too late or very late if uh, the politicians realize that they forgot uh, a big part of uh, people. I, I, I have a question. Is that not a part of the reunification problems? It, it is also a part of the uh, reunification uh, uh, problem, but, n but not only. Of course, uh, there was, uh, they were uh, 40 years or more um, separated from uh, uh, the other, especially from the Western uh, world. And so they are afraid about uh, about uh, strangers, about migrants, but they have no migrants. They uh, vote against the migrants uh, in the states where there are no migrants. Uh, uh, that is the situation. Hmm? Yes, it is also, but not only. Oh, yeah, I want to mention something to the Catalonia thing because Rodrigo and Horst and I discussed a lot about that the last days. Nowadays, so everyone uh, talks about that, but you can't read in the newspapers or has uh, nothing in the media about this uh, Franco dictatorship or very super less. So probably they start a new civil war. Or I, I don't know what happens there. But they really forgot this history. They really did something like uh, we did in after World War II, uh, entnazifizierung, uh, uh, so back from or what's, uh, Rodrigo, help me, what's the uh, term for, uh, they have in Spain this trans, Transition. Transition. But what, what, what does this mean? So now we make a cut, dictatorship is back, and we go on, start a process with another politics, with, uh, I don't know, democracy, or what does this mean? And because of that... Maybe I'm too pessimistic, but that's the, 
that's my my mood now. Let's organize uh, organize the pessimism. Uh, I think the hiatus, unfortunately, has not the moment of dictatorship, but the moment of democracy. Those brief, enlightened moments. I'm pessimist, but when I proposed this subject, it's actually a horse idea, the, the, the hiatus. He was, think about hiatus, the hiatus of representation, the suspension of representation when we finish time. And you think about hiatus, when you read the text, it's all part of our culture. When I talk about it, unfortunately, the exception is our rule here. So that's the idea. Politically, we are reading Brazil the same way. I'd like to finish. Thank you so very much for your participation. It was beautiful. It was very emotional. And I'd like to thank you all to be here. And we are going to carry on this discussion after lunch. We come back at four, at 2 o'clock.